All right. Hello, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started with today's live session. We're talking about better gut health, the key to stress and disease mitigation in aquaculture. This is the second part of our Mediterranean aquaculture webinar series this month. My name is Ryan Hines. I'm the communications manager at Biomin. I'm very glad you can be joining us today. With me are two Biomin experts. First one I'll present to you, Laurent Gabardo. Hello, Laurent. Hello, Ryan. I'm, it's a pleasure to be with you today and with the audience. I'm Lohan Gabardo. I'm product manager in the Competence Center of Mycotox Mycotoxins here in Biomin. And we'll talk a little bit about mycotoxins today. We absolutely will. Uh, and before we get to that, we're going to talk a bit more about stress and disease mitigation with Ben Standen. Hello, Ben. Hi, good morning, Ryan. Good morning, everybody. Also, pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Ben Standen. I'm product manager in the Competence Center Gut Performance. So looking after our products around phytogenics, acidifiers and microbials, which have an aqua application. So my main role is to support customers on a global basis to apply the products in the operations and ultimately improving the performance of the animals and the profitability of the business. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. Very glad to have both of you with us. Uh, just a word to our live audience who's listening right now. I uh, would like to point out that this is an interactive session. So it means that at any point during today's discussion, if you have a question for Ben or for Laurent, you can go ahead and use the chat function here in your webinar platform uh, to enter that question. We'll get to as many of those questions as we can uh, at the dedicated question and answer section towards the end of the hour. It also means that we're going to be able to ask you your opinion on a couple of topics and we'll have some audience poll questions for you to participate and weigh in with your opinions so please go ahead and look for those we look forward to a great discussion to tee us off we're going to get back into our uh, framework which was sustainability we're talking about aquaculture across the mediterranean uh, a large area we last time we talked about um, nutrition and feed formulation and the replacement of fish meal and fish oil uh, here we're talking more about stress and disease mitigation and to bring us into that context, uh, Ben, you're going to tee us off. Excellent. Thank you for the introduction, Ryan. Um, so as Ryan has uh, pointed out today, we are focusing on three key areas, really, which are all interconnected and gut health, stress and disease. So let's jump straight into the topic and talk about stress. There's many different definitions of stress and it's been discussed at great length in aquaculture and also in other species. And this is perhaps one of the most widely accepted and uh, simple, I would say, definitions of stress. It was uh, defined by Hans Selye, a Canadian uh, doctor in the 50s, who states that stress is the sum of all the physiological responses by which an animal tries to maintain or reestablish normal metabolism. And there can be many different stresses in aquaculture. So these can come from a physical uh, side, for example, temperature, photo periods, dissolved oxygen and sound. They can come from a chemical uh, um, uh, category. So for example, water quality, pollution, metabolic waste, for example, nitrogen waste, phosphorus waste, for example. They can be biological based, so coming from pathogens, that's bacterial, viral, parasitic. It can also come from predation, which can cause the animals to stress. And also stocking density can be a big stressor for these animals. Stocking density is a very interesting one because fish in by very nature are shoaling animals. So too high stocking densities can cause stress, but equally too low stocking densities can also cause stress. So it's a very fine balance in terms of what the perfect stocking density might be. Stress might also come from the very nature and the, the procedural uh, practices, the husbandry which we have to apply in aquaculture. For example, by handling, by transporting the fish, treating disease is often extremely uh, stressful, especially when we think about um, bath treatments for parasites, for example. And also feeding regimes, there's times where maybe we have to have make a starvation period just before harvest. This can also be very stressful for the animals. So how do the animals deal with this stress? Well, the primary response would mean an increase in different hormone levels, primarily uh, cortisol, but could also be other um, corticosteroids, for example. 
Secondly, we have the secondary response. So this will involve different metabolic changes and especially affecting the immune function of the animal. And if this stress continues, we will end up with a tertiary response. So this will no longer be restricted to the organ, it will be at the organism level. And this means we can see big changes to growth in reproduction, health, disease resistance, and also behavior. And this is typically what we would see in a kind of a chronic response, uh, stress response. But we also have acute stress response. And this means that depending on the stressor, the fish can go directly to the secondary response or to the tertiary response. And this can be even more problematic for the animal. Ultimately, if we fail to control the stress, it will lead to disease. And this is a big problem for the animal, of course, in terms of the health, the welfare of that animal, but it is also a big problem for us because these diseases are associated with huge economic impacts. So do you know the true cost of aquaculture diseases? Well, we could discuss this at great length. And actually these are on the right-hand side, you see some estimates which were presented at one of our World Nutrition Forums a couple of years ago in terms of the most famous or let's say the most infamous um, diseases from a bacterial nature, from a viral nature and from a parasitic nature. And the numbers may be slightly off, they may be slightly incorrect, but we can all agree the cost of disease is in the billions of US dollars every single year. And this is just in direct losses alone. There's lots of hidden costs, for example, cost of diagnostics, cost of treatment, um, costs of feeding, for example. So these are a very, very expensive problem is disease. Traditionally in aquaculture, as in agriculture, we have quite a reactive approach or traditionally we've had a very reactive approach to disease utilizing antibiotics and chemicals. But of course, now we know that there's problems purely uh, relying on this because of the, um, the emergence of antimicrobial resistance which of course has strong um, uh, consequences for human health. There's also another issue with antibiotics and chemicals in that fact that they can be very stressful for the fish as well. These chemical treatments, these bath treatments are very stressful for the animal. They can end up with wounds on their skin, which can be an opportunity for um, secondary infection. And very often the antibiotics will also be quite bitter as well to the fish. So it can actually cause stress and cause them to reduce their, their intake of feed. And bearing in mind, if the fish is sick, it also won't be eating very much feed anyway. So we know that we need to kind of move from a reactive approach to a preventative or a prophylactic approach to stress and to disease. And to do this, we must consider three key factors. Those factors related to the host, those factors related to the pathogen, and those factors related to the environment. Each of these categories is of equal importance and it's all about the balance. So if there's an imbalance in the system, then disease may become inevitable. And each of these categories as well requires a slightly different uh, management practice, a slightly different nutritional program, for example, especially in terms of, of additives. So what I will also mention here is when we're talking about marine fish, especially, we talk about uh, uh, applying these health related components. One of the best routes to apply these is through the feed. Perhaps if you're using a pond culture, it might be possible to add to the water, but more often than not, these health related products go through the feed and they'll be acting primarily on the gut. So this is where we introduce the topic of gut health. We think about gut health as a kind of a buzzword almost. It's quite a new topic, um, but actually it's really not a new topic at all. So this is a uh, Hippocrates, an ancient Greek philosopher. Um, he was around on almost two and a half thousand years ago, and he's known as the father of uh, modern medicine. And for all his thinkings, he's believed to have the belief that all disease begins in the gut. Now we know today that that's not true. There are other causes of disease and you could argue in aquaculture, gill health and skin health is perhaps equally important to gut health. 
but it just it emphasizes how important gut health was even two and a half thousand years ago and it's as relevant and as important today as it was back then what do we mean by gut health we talk about gut health gut performance but what does it really mean again we could discuss this at great length different people would have different opinions but at biomin this is how we would define gut health or improving gut performance firstly we have to improve the efficiency of the gut so the gut is one of the major organs which separates the outside world to the inside world and it's very very important that it can effectively take up nutrients from the feed but it's also a major route of infection for pathogens. So it also has to have a strong barrier function to block the, uh, the introduction and the infection for disease. So the efficiency of the gut as a, uh, to absorb nutrients and barrier function is very important. We need to prevent disease, not just those associated with the gut especially, but also those that affect the whole organism as well and their related side effects. And thirdly, we need to re-establish and maintain gut integrity, especially after a dysfunction. And here we do it, we've done a lot of research on gut microbiota and how it's important in terms of health, in terms of nutrition. And there's many different factors that can change the gut microbiota. For example, environmental uh, changes, um, changes to diet, um, antibiotics and different chemical treatments. So it's really important we re-establish and maintain the gut integrity and we look after the gut microbiota. We stabilize this uh, gut microbiota throughout the production cycle. In terms of improving gut integrity, I'd like to pick up on this topic first. And when we think about the solutions we can use, the phytogenic category is a really uh, popular um, uh, strategy. And we really approach this in three main ways, uh, with arguably a fourth. We know that phytogenics can improve the gut microbiota or can change the gut microbiota, and that they're especially effective at reducing gram positive pathogens. We also know that phytogenics can improve the feed digestibility. So we've done a lot of work by looking at the activity of different enzymes, for example, pepsin in fish and perhaps trypsin in shrimp. And this way we can improve the digestibility of the feeds. We also know that phytogenics and essential oils can have anti-inflammatory processes. And in the webinar two weeks ago, Pete mentioned that 10 to 30% of the total animal's energy can be channeled into these inflammation processes. And this is energy that could otherwise be utilized for growth, for immunity. So it's really important that we use these anti-inflammatory components. And then we've also done some work on fillet quality, how we can improve the antioxidant profile of the fillet, for example, which can have uh, consequences for improved shelf life. And ultimately, when you uh, combine these, again, they're all interconnected, but we can improve the profitability, we can reduce costs and improve the performance in a sustainable way. And this is what I'd like to jump to next. This is a trial that we had in a European sea bass with our phytogenic product, um, Digestron PET MG. We have four treatments here, a high fish meal treatment, high fish meal treatment with PEP, low fish meal treatment, and low fish meal treatment with PEP. And what's interesting, regardless of the treatment, we see significantly improved growth performance. And when you look at the protein efficiency ratio, again, significant improvements coming from the PEP primarily because of these digestibility benefits. And that's interesting in itself. It's nice to get good growth performance, but it's also interesting to know why it is happening and what other benefits are behind this growth performance. And this is where we can look at what's happening on a, a, a microscopic level. Here in the gut, you see the epithelia. These are the enterocytes here. And on top of the enterocytes, you have these microvilli. These microvilli will be um, absorbing nutrients and they will also have a barrier function. And the longer the microvilli and the more densely packed the microvilli, the better the absorption and the better the barrier function. And again, you can see in both in the proximal intestine and the distal intestine, we can have a significant improvement in the brush border villi length. 
So that's partly explaining the, uh, the performance. We have better absorption of nutrients, but more importantly, we have better barrier function, which leads to better health in the animal. And the reason that I say it's a good candidate for sustainable fish production is when we analyze a little bit more the, the fee conversion ratio. Fee conversion ratio is an interesting parameter because it means two things. If you can improve your FCR, you can reduce your fee costs and you can improve your water quality. So let's, for example, take this real data that we've collected with and without phytogenics. We can reduce our FCR from 1.49 to about 1.41 in CBAS. What does this mean for a producer or an integrator who wants, for example, to produce 500 tons of fish? Well, without the feed additive, without a phytogenic, I would have an FCR of 1.49, which means I need to use 745 tons of feed. And if we assume that the digestibility is 90%, that means I would have 75 tons of feces in my cage environment. And this ultimately has an environmental cost. For example, with all these extra nutrients in the water, you would have increase in algal blooms, you would risk lowering your dissolved oxygen, ultimately causing stress and disease in these animals. But we can change this with phytogenics. We could reduce the FCR to 1.41 which ultimately means to produce the same amount of fish, we need less feed, only 705 tons of feed, a saving of 40 tons of feed. And if we assume the same digestibility, 90%, this feed would only produce 71 tons of feces, which means we have four tons less in our water. Ultimately, that means we can improve the water quality with reduced waste, and we have a better environment for our animals to, to grow in. And these sustainability kind of concepts are extremely important for certification schemes, some of which you see in the bottom left. They all have slightly different criteria, but sustainability is always at their core. Next, I'd like to touch on the second category, how we can reduce in, um, intestinal disease and disease of the fish. And this is where we have a slight focus on the Mediterranean uh, region. But before that, Ryan, I think we are coming to a poll. Absolutely, because uh, our live audience today is representative of uh, many businesses across Mediterranean countries in the aqua sector. Uh, let's go ahead and get your opinions on the challenges that you face. Please go ahead and with our first poll question, pick uh, the one answer that best fits your situation. What is the major disease challenge which you are facing? Is it bacterial? Is it primarily viral? Is it parasitic? Or is it more than one of these types of challenges? We see the votes are already coming in. We're gonna give everyone, everyone just a moment to go ahead and make your selection. And then we're gonna go ahead and read out those results. And as we can see, we've got a good amount of participation. All right, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll right now. I wanna thank you for everyone who has voted. Let me share those results with you immediately. Now we can see that uh, the leading answer here is that you're in fact facing more than one type of challenge. So of, of the three named uh, at 44%, that's followed by bacterial and viral challenges, both received a quarter of the votes and the parasites at 6%. Uh, ben, is that something that you see that's uh, typical in industry, typical in the Mediterranean region? Uh, I would say it's not just typical of the Mediterranean, but it's also typical of what we might see on, on a global level. We know that in our environment, we've got many different uh, bacteria, most, uh, some of which can be opportunistic. We also have many different uh, viruses and many different parasites. So it's not surprising that we see a multitude of different pathogens or different types of pathogens all attacking our fish at once. And for example, when we talk about parasites, parasites can be a, a big problem, but they don't really cause that much mortality themselves. Actually, they open up the fish for secondary pathogens, for example. So it's very, very common to see uh, parasites plus bacteria or parasites plus viruses or indeed everything. 
Um, but this really drives home the importance of a, a, a prophylactic health-based uh, strategy because we are, in, we are facing numerous different pathogens. Sure. Perhaps then I can move on to the slides. Um, actually, this is a paper uh, that was published uh, last year or maybe two years ago. Um, and actually, it was also a survey of different um, uh, Mediterranean countries and different operations around the Mediterranean region in sea bass and in sea bream. And they, you can see here what they reviewed. It's only about 5% of the total um, production units. So we have to bear in mind that actually it's a relatively small um, um, survey size. But what's very interesting is actually if they look at the sea bass, for example. Sorry, but I, I hate to interrupt. Um... But we might be having a visibility issue with the slides. So what we're going to go ahead and do is just re-grant you permission to share your slides, if you don't sure. mind, and then bring those back up so that everyone can see uh, the paper and the data that you're referring to. There we go. OK. It should be so good. It should, Great. It should be the slide diseases in European sea bass. We have it now. That's perfect. Please proceed. Thank you. Excellent. Sorry for the sorry for that. But these authors actually found something similar out of the surveys and out of the people and the, the, um, the operations that they interviewed, bacteria were dominating the reports. In particular, Vibrio, Tenacibaculum and Photobacterium were particularly problematic. This was over the years 2015 through to 2017. And what they also found, a typical survival in European sea bass in the grad phase was between 80 to 85 percent. 10% of which could be attributed to pathologies. And here you can see again virus here wasn't too, too uh, prevalent, mainly coming from this um, uh, vervnn disease. And parasites, they are, uh, can be a problem in, uh, in sea bass. And what's also interesting is when we compare those diseases that we see in sea bass with those diseases that we see in sea bream. So for example, the sea bass is what you see on the top graph, and here we see the domination of bacterial pathogens, Vibrio, Tenacibaculum, and Photobacterium. But if you look at C. bream, we also see a, a high prevalence of parasite. This is a, a gill flu, sparocytile. And this also might explain the results that we saw in the poll. So we have today uh, um, all different kinds of stakeholders in the industry, those working with marine species, those working with rainbow trout, we have a lot of Egyptian delegates today, so they're working with tilapia. So, of course, all of these different species will have different types of um, pathogen um, to, to deal with. But this is very interesting in itself. And also we see some seasonal variations in, in the different pathologies. So then the next question is, how can we be proactive and how can we use feed additives to improve the gut health which then has a direct consequence for reduced disease resistance. And we are working in three main areas of research in terms of combating these pathogens, primarily bacterial pathogens, because this is what we see as the biggest threat to the industry globally. So we can utilize those components and those additives which have direct pathogen inhibition. We can also look for those components which have quorum quenching properties. So these are interrupting the pathogen communication and therefore reducing their virulence, for example. And we can find these quorum quenchers in phytogenics. We can find them in different bacteria and different algae as well. And we can also look for those components which interact with the host microbiota. They might have an effect on the epithelia and therefore can modulate the immune system of the animal. And the first one uh, I'd like to touch on is how we can use organic acids to reduce gram-negative pathogens in particular, with a special focus on tenacibaculum, because this is also prevalent in the Mediterranean region. So we actually used uh, salmon uh, as a model here. Um, this was a trial conducted in Chile. Here you can see the setup. So it's a huge field trial at two different sites, utilizing almost one million fish it was conducted in fish, which were about uh, 1.7, 1.8 kilograms, and during the summer in Chile. So during our winter, their summer. And this is when the gram-negative pressure is extremely um, uh, high in the salmon. And we had two treatments, so a very simple experimental design. Biotronic at two kilograms per ton, 
versus a positive control, which was a, a competitor product. And the main effect we wanted to see was a reduce or a, a reduction in mortality um, by gram-negative pathogens, Pisca rickettsia, and also tenacibaculum, which is the focus of, of our talk today. And here, what you can see is that in terms of the tenacibaculum, you can see some of the clinical signs on the right-hand side. This is really a nasty disease. It can basically cause severe necrosis and even uh, basically eats the flesh of the, of the fish. You can see huge ulcerations to the, to the skin and to the head. If you look in the mouth, you can also see this um, stomatitis in the mouth from yellow, uh, yellow kind of uh, growths and also on the gills as well. So this is a very nasty disease. And what we can see in both the sites, we actually see a significant reduction in, this, uh, in these mortalities, between 65 and 74% mortality in each case. So this is a really great result to suggest that organic acids can have be particularly effective against gram-negative pathogens. If we look at total mortalities, again, we see significantly lower mortalities at both sites not just because of tenacibaculum, but because of other mortalities or other pathologies as well. But what about gram-positive pathogens? Gram-positives are slightly different because of their membrane, so we need a different structure or a different strategy to fight um, gram-positive pathogens. And this is where phytogenics again become a little bit more interesting. So this is a trial that we conducted in our facility in Vietnam, and you can see some pictures here on the right. We basically wanted to see if phytogenics can help um, prevent streptococcus mortalities in tilapia. And if you see fish suffering from streptococcus, this is typically what you will see, this exophthalmia, this popeye, this bubble eye. Um, there will either be uh, some other clinical signs as well. But what we see here, if we have the, uh, the immersion uh, challenge here at day zero, without any kind of um, prophylactic measure, you will end up with survival just over 50%. And actually, this is still decreasing as well. But with a phytogenic, you can increase this survival almost by 30% in real numbers. So this is one take-home message that phytogenics can be particularly in, important for reducing mortalities. But we also see something else which is very interesting here. We actually see that in the phytogenic treatment, the rate of mortality is much slower and this is very interesting on the field because the farmer might be able to see the clinical signs in the fish, but without the mortalities. So he or she can then put in place an alternative therapy or alternative practices to really reduce this mortality more. So in effect, you are buying the customer or buying the producer time with these kind of additives as well. And time is very, very important. Very often, you don't have much time to make a decision on site. So the more time you have, the better your decision will be. And then we come to another category of additives, yeast. And we also received some questions about this last week. So I'd like to touch very briefly on this topic before handing the this stage over to Laran. And yeast is a very interesting um, additive uh, for a number of different reasons. Last week, it was mentioned in a nutritional perspective and how it can be used as a protein source, but it can also be used in terms of building a more robust animal and allowing it to handle disease better. And this is because in the yeast cell, we have many different fractions, each of which can have different immune um, benefits. So if we see a cross section of the yeast here, um, this is the cell wall, the outermost layer will be mannan oligosaccharides or MOS. This can have a prebiotic effect. And this is where we come to the third important part of gut health, maintaining a healthy microbiota. And prebiotics are basically food for probiotics or for commensal bacteria. So by having a prebiotic effect, we can stabilize and maintain the gut microbiota. And they can also modulate the immune system and actually absorb pathogens um, directly as well. Beta-glucans, I don't think I need to go into a huge amount of details. They've been investigated quite extensively over the last few decades. And we know that they can act on different receptors in the gut, um, dectin-1, um, complement receptor-3, and the different TLRs. And this way they can modulate and initiate a whole cascade of different immune responses, both pro-inflammatory going up and anti-inflammatory sometimes to come down. 
and they can activate several immune cells as well, for example, monocytes, macrophages, um, natural killer cells, dendritic cells. There's a whole host of evidence to suggest that beta-glucans um, can be extremely helpful in terms of driving an immune response. And if we look in the cell as well, actually internally, uh, we obviously have a source of nucleotides. And nucleotides are also a very interesting category of additives because the de novo synthesis of nucleotides is extremely energy expensive. And these are basically the building blocks of life. So you, it's really, really important to have these in the diet, especially, for example, when you have some kind of stressor, maybe you have the sloughing of the epithelia, you have the apoptosis, so you need to replace these cells. So especially during uh, stressful periods, um, nucleotides are particularly important. And also it was touched on last week that uh, fish meal is a very rich source of nucleotides. So as we reduce the fish meal levels, it's also really important, as Pete said, to put back what you are missing. And nucleotides will be one of these missing components in, in the plant materials. And we also know that they can modulate gene expression and also act as vaccine adjuvants. So if you put all of these together, they can have a very strong effect on stress and disease and resistance. And this is the last slide that I'd like to show you. It's a trial that we did in, uh, Euro in uh, Asian CBAS, sorry. So the European equivalent to, to the CBAS. And we were looking at different yeast components and different yeast fractions and how they might benefit the animal in terms of survival after a streptococcus challenge. And here we compared uh, Leverbond, which is a whole yeast fraction, an autolyzed yeast uh, with beta-glucans, and then we compared it with nucleotides as well. You can see from the survival curve, the lowest mortality, so the lowest survival was observed in the control treatments. The nucleotides and the beta-glucans can help survival. Survival was increased, but the highest survival was observed when you use a combination of these immune components. So the nucleotides, beta-glucans, and the MOS. With that, I'd like to uh, thank you for listening to my part, um, and I'd like to hand over to, uh, to Laran. Great, thank you for those remarks, Ben. Uh, absolutely, we're gonna go over to Laurent. Uh, so she can pull up her slides and share them with us. We have them right there. Let me just remind our audience uh, that we are continuing to receive questions and we encourage you to submit those as we uh, continue on the topic of mycotoxins with Laurent and we will uh, have that as part of our discussion in the Q&A. So Laurent, please speak to us a bit about mycotoxins. Great. It was a great introduction of Ben with the stressors and which uh, which are the challenges into gut health and the overall health of the, the aquatic species. And now we're going to talk about one of the stressors that are the mycotoxins. Well, why do we want to talk about mycotoxins? Do they matter? Do they really matter in aquaculture? Here are some bullet points. Um, to show you why mycotoxins are important in this production. First of all, we are uh, talking about uh, the sustainability and the replacement of fish meal into plant-based ingredients in the aqua formulations. Therefore, when we have more plant ingredients, we have also more mycotoxins. And this is the why we also have to consider more mycotoxins into our formulations. Second, the climate change. The climate change, the global warming, it brings uh, better conditions for the fungi to produce mycotoxins in the field and also during the storage. And we also have a global distribution of mycotoxins. We have different mycotoxins and we also have a synergism between them. If we look in, in this circle, we can see that we have in the red line the synergistic effect by mycotoxins, in the different ones, and we also have the additional effect in the dotted line. We also have more the emerging mycotoxins that are the mycotoxins that they are not always analyzed by simple methodologies. And then we also have to consider it as the, a trigger to the health of the animals. When we have mycotoxins, we have this immunosuppressive and these health issues for the animals. And it can consequently take into economic losses that are not always considered by farmers and by aquatic producers. 
And mycotoxins, they are considered food and feed contaminants for important authorities, as the European Food and Safe Authority, yes, the FAO, and also the World Health Organization. They have dedicated pages just for mycotoxins. And when we talk about uh, fish and shrimp, we say we can we know that mycotoxins they can have a carryover into the final products, and this is a trigger for the public health also. Great. Now, well, Lauren, if if I may, oh, please go ahead. I think now we have one more poll question, right? That's exactly what I wanted to say. Thank you, Laurent. Um, now let's turn to you, uh, our audience, and ask you about your practices regarding mycotoxins. Do you regularly test your aqua feed materials for mycotoxins? Now please go ahead and choose the one best answer that fits your situation. Yes, no, or not sure. And if you're not running a, your own operation, if you're in a consulting role, uh, consider this question as, do you recommend regularly testing aqua feed materials for mycotoxins? We see plenty of answers coming in already. And we'll give everyone just another moment to go ahead and vote if you'd like to. And it looks like the votes have come in, so I'm going to go ahead and close the poll. But thank you for everyone who's shared and weighed in on this question for us. Here are the results. 61% uh, of you said, yes, you regularly test aquafeed materials for mycotoxins, followed by a third who said, well, they were unsure, and then 6% did not. Uh, Laurent, what do you make of that, those results? Is that something common? Is that recommended? Yeah, this is a great opportunity for us to say that the 61%, uh, they're doing the right thing because we cannot evaluate and we cannot consider as a challenge if we don't really know what is happening, what do we have of contamination in the feed. This is the why we all always uh, reinforce the importance of having an analysis and a good methodology uh, to analyze these, these mycotoxins in the feed. Also, the sampling is really important uh, for us to have a good, uh, a good result and a, a trustable one. Okay, let's continue. Well, Biomin um, makes a, a worldwide survey uh, every year, and these are the results that we have for 2020. It was analyzed more than 22 thousand samples during one year and in 79 countries. This is the why we can say that we, we have a good overview over mycotoxins in the whole world. And we can see here in the corner in the left uh, that more, the mycotoxins we have in the samples, more than one mycotoxins for 67%. And this is quite important. When we talk about mycotoxins, we have the synergism between the mycotoxins, it's not just one, but it's more than one. And going a bit deeper into the, into the region, we can see that the fumanizin and don are followed by zen are the main contaminants in the feed uh, for this, this region. And well, it's also important to reinforce that ingredients are the, the contaminants that comes into the feeds, and we have different profiles of contamination in different ingredients. For example, here uh, I selected the main ones. And for example, when, when you take a look, a deeper look into the soybean, the main contamination comes from zero non and don. But zero non, we have the contamination, the prevalence, which one. 55% of the samples are positive for zero noon. Of this 55, 70 PPBs are the average uh, contamination of them. This is an, an important uh, prevalence of contamination and also a uh, level of contamination. We always um, evaluate these both parameters together. For example, for Dawn, we have a lower percentage of contamination, but we also have a, a huge uh, percentage of average. This is the why we, for soybean, for example, we consider the main contaminants as Dawn uh, and zero and none. 
a different profile we see in corn. For example, aflatoxin is the most uh, toxic mycotoxin. Just 8% are contaminated by aflatoxin, but the average is 22. It, it means that they are very important. When you have aflatoxin, they have important contaminations into, into the feed that can cause health problems. We also have uh, important prevalence and level of contaminations for zero and non, don and fumonisin in corn. And 77% of the samples are contaminated by more than one mycotoxin. Another ingredient that is very used is the DGS. Uh, we consider the DGS a very challenging ingredient for mycotoxins when we take a look over mycotoxins because we have a high prevalence of contamination for zero, non, don, and fumonisin. And we also have uh, an average of contamination quite high. 92% of the samples are positive uh, for more than one mycotoxins. And wheat is considered uh, tr uh, a tricky also for zero and non and non. This is an overview that we have for all the feed ingredients, the, mo the main ones that we have for aquaculture. And I wanted you just to take a look in this number because we're going to explain that more in the next slides. But we have here an average of contamination that these are realistic numbers. And we're going to see that these realistic numbers, they're, they're also uh, correlated with uh, health issues that we can have in the fish. Let's go for the first one, aflatoxin. Aflatoxin is a storage mycotoxin produced by Aspergillus. It's related uh, with liver and kidney problems, and it causes immune suppression and it affects the growth and the performance of the animals. Uh, regarding the sensitivity, aflatoxin is considered the most um, toxic mycotoxin. Even low amounts of aflatoxin can cause a big problems, health problems in the animals. Regarding the different species, the sea bass uh, is the most sensitive, followed, followed by rainbow trout, catfish, zebrafish, and tilapia. Here we have an example of a paper uh, published in, uh, in sea bass with a contamination of mycotoxin, of aflatoxin. And we see that the contamination in this paper was uh, 18 ppb for 42 days. I have to remember here that yes considers that 20 ppb is the limit for feed material. And here we see that the contamination level was even lower than the considered one as the limit for EFSA. As we can see in the results, after 42 days, uh, we can evaluate the enzymes, the liver enzymes, and we can also see that there is a significant difference between the, um, the control group and the group challenge with aflatoxin, meaning that we have here a liver and a renal dysfunction. When we go deeper, into the in, into the the, prote the blood proteins, we see that there is a huge difference, uh, a decreased number of the total proteins uh, of the uh, in the blood. It it means we have immune suppression of these animals. And what is even more interesting in this in this paper is that the negative impact that we can have for human health. When it was analyzed, the residual of aflatoxin um, in, the, in the fish byproduct, we have a percent, uh, a contamination of 4.25 ppb of aflatoxin. It means that we have a danger for human health. This is, a, this is considered a public health issue. FDA, for example, the Feed and Drug Administration in the US, it considers um, set 5 ppb as a limit for aflatoxin in the, in the human foods. 
This is the why aflatoxins, oh, even if they have lower percentage, lower prevalence, we always have to take a look and to be very careful with the quantity uh, of aflatoxin with the uh, contamination that we have in feed because we have this public health issue. And as we see here, only 18%, 18 ppb that is even lower the, the, the recommendations of e European Union, they are quite important and quite um, have negative effects for the animals and also for this issue, this public issue. Zearalenon is another mycotoxin, um, they, different from the aflatoxin, that is the storage mycotoxin, it is considered a field mycotoxin that is produced by fusarium during the, the, the production in the crop production. Zearalenon is very similar to the hormone estrogen and it causes the dysfunctions in the reproductive tract and also immune suppression. In fish, it can influence the, the efficiency of hormonal sex rehearsal. For example, in tilapia, this is quite important. And also we can have this environmental feminization that uh, it can influence it in the performance. It's important to take a look for zeralinone in the hatchery and in the nursery. One more study here to show us why the contaminations even in the European Union maximum recommendations are quite dangerous for the animals. Here we have a contamination, we have a study in rainbow trout and uh, we see that even 2 ppm of ZRL non it's important uh, it, and can have disorders to the gonadal development of this fish. Here in, the, in these images, you can see that there is um, a ovary collected from a genetic male. That is, it uh, means that the, the hormonal sex reversal wasn't effective. We can also see that the, govern, the, the, the gonad produces uh, female and male gametes. That means that we are not having just um, the expression of one sex in the species. And the disproportion here, it, this is quite uh, interesting to, to look, uh, even with our eyes, that we can have a disproportion between ovaries and also the, uh, the fragmentation of the test testicular lobes, meaning that these organs are not working well because they have the influence of a, a synergism of, of hormonal uh, problems. Well, these are realistic exposures and we can already have pathological uh, reproductive changes in rainbow trout. And what is more, even more interesting about ZRL non is that most of the chronic effects, the effects that we have in lower dosages are not addressed in the scientific papers. This is very important for mycotoxins because most of the of the problems that we have, sometimes they are uh, connected with the subclinical effect that are not considered for the farmers and the producers. Fumodizines are produced also from, uh, for, by Fusarium, that is the, this field mycotoxin. Uh, Fumodizines are related with the, this influence in this in sphingolipid metabolism and it causes problems in the cell wall integrity and the oxidative stress. When we think about pulmonizins, uh, we are related with the liver and respiratory problems causing this immune suppression and also influencing the performance. Uh, we have here a study with Stibrin and with low contaminations of pulmonizin. This is, for example, a, a really nice study. When we talk about the ingredients, we see that um, many of them, uh, we have contaminations of 700, uh, 1000 ppb uh, of humanism. And here we are talking just about 168 and uh, 333 ppbs. These are low contaminations for humanism. And we have these results after 63 days. Regarding the performance, we can see here that there is um, a low body weight gain um, 
in a significant difference between even for the lowest contamination and a quite higher contamination of uh, fumonisin, they can both of them they can already uh, reduce the the weight gain of the animals. The feed conversion ratio is increased increased in both cases, and uh, the protein efficient retention it's also decreased in in the contaminations of fumonisins. We also have this fillet uh, difference. Well, we are always looking for uh, the quality and of the fillet and the composition, and we see that significantly uh, contaminations with fumonisin in low levels they can have. Um, a significant difference in the composition of fat and energy retention in this bowl, um, uh, in this bowl fillet quality. So the legal limits that we consider for fumonisins they should be uh, even lower. The oxynivalenol or don it's also produced as the same as, as zearanone and fumonisin. It's also produced by fusarium. Don, it's, it's quite interesting in this webinar because it also it's well connected with this intestinal health uh, because it reduces the protein synthesis and it's connected with the reduced intestinal integrity. It causes an immune suppression and then we go for this performance and economical reflections. The rainbow trout, uh, we have here one more study in rainbow trout. And when we have a high contamination by dawn, uh, we consider here 2.7 uh, ppm or uh, of dawn, we can see, uh, we can I see uh, the abnormal body conformation uh, with the length reduced in relation with this width. This, is, this means that the animal is having a challenge and we can also have a liver um, uh, increased size. And this is uh, when we see the animals that they can have even a higher uh, body weight, but it doesn't mean that we have this weight related with the fillet. When we have low contamination by dawn, uh, here we are talking about 367 ppb. As you, you can remember in the ingredients, we are talking about 700, uh, 550, for example. Uh, here we have even low contamination by dawn. And this is uh, very nice for us to think about the chronic effect of the low dosage of a mycotoxin. Dawn, uh, it was uh, between 168 days. Uh, the evaluation and this we can have the we can see that the final body weight gain had a difference in the end um, of less than 10 percent body weight related with the contamination by dawn. This is very important because this is might be a notice by the farmers and it causes the economic losses. Another another example here was the feed conversion ratio. It just started and day 37, um, we, can, we could see difference between the, the feed conversion ratio increasage when we have the dome contamination. It means that the chronic effect of mycotoxins, they can have this immunosuppressive and also this gut integrity issues. Um, that are related with the performance. And sometimes in the end, we are not just considering this as a stressors. Regarding the gut health, here is a study with Microfix Plus, that is one, uh, one of the most complete products in our range with the, the tilapia. And uh, the animals were fed um, with uh, don and fumonisin in realistic concentrations, and then we treated them with the, with the Microfix Plus. And we can see here, we can see, oops, sorry. 
uh, we can see here that when we have the control, we, we can you can look for um, uh, very in, integri in, integrity in the intestinal velocity. The epithelium is normal and it's very well connected with the, the velocity looking normal. When we go in, in the toxin, don, don and fumonisine in 2000 ppb, we can see that you have the disruption in the intestinal integrity. It can cause secondary uh, inflammations and infections that are not always related to the mycotoxins. They are considered also stressors um, that comes from mycotoxins that could cause secondary infections. And when we have the usage of Microfix Plus, you can recover this, uh, this uh, characteristic of the, the health epithelium. In Microfix range, we have three strategies that are considered for uh, counteracting mycotoxins. First of them are the biotransformation, bioprotection, and the third one is the adsorption. We can see here for each mycotoxin that we talk about, uh, we have a different, a different strategy. This is related with the, the characteristics of the structure of the mycotoxins. Then, for example, biotransformation is a strategy that breaks the, the toxic compound in the orig original molecule into non-toxic compounds then this doesn't affect the animal uh, health. The bioprotection is a mix of plant ingredients that are focused uh, to enhance uh, the gut integrity and also the protection of the liver that are the main targets of mycotoxins. And the absorption is the third strategy that is focused in the adsorbable mycotoxins as aflatoxins, the ergoalkaloids, and also endotoxins. Adsorption is responsible to bind these mycotoxins and take them out of the, the intestinal tract without causing any problems. As we can see here, uh, the microfix range is composed by different products that they can have focus in one or more than one type of mycotoxins. For example, microfix secure, it's, uh, it has the strategy of adsorption. Microfix protect, protect has plus the adsorption and the bioprotection. Microfix focus is composed by funzyme, that is the enzyme that breaks the fumonisins together with the absorption. Microfix Select has uh, almost all of the strategies, but less the zero known characteristic to break the molecule. And Microfix Plus is the main uh, product of the range that is, uh, it, it, uh, is the most complete one that can get all the mycotoxins. We also have the Funzyme Sol, that is the purified enzyme against fumonisins and uh, um, can be applied with this for these mycotoxins. Well, here are some take home messages, and I will invite uh, again Ben to, uh, to have these take home messages for you. Sure, thank you very much for that very detailed um, overview, Laurent. So just very briefly to leave you with some take home messages. I think we've been through how unmanaged stress can lead to disease. And it's a problem for the fish, of course, for the fish welfare. And it's also a problem for us in the industry because it causes huge economic losses. And feed, offers, uh, feed additives are a tool to improve the feed efficiency and therefore you can reduce your waste output. So it has environmental benefits as well as gut benefits. It's a good strategy to reduce stress, improve immunity, and ultimately, if you really do this in the correct way, you can improve your disease resistance on the field. And then lastly, uh, Loran has taken us through the negative effects of mycotoxins. So even if you have the best uh, feed additives, the best management practices um, in the world, if you have mycotoxins in your diet, it's extremely difficult to reach that full potential of your animals. So uh, we know that they're frequently occurring in, in aquafeeds. We could demonstrate that with our survey and the different commodities. It's eating into the health of the animals and it's eating into the profitability of your business. 
And we can also use different strategies, um, biotransformation, bioprotection, and also adsorption to really come up with a robust mycotoxin risk plan for your specific operations. So then we can move to the next slide, Laurent, please. And on a final note, really a final note, um, one key message here is when we talk about feed additives, there is no silver bullet solution. We have very complex challenges on the field. And therefore, to bring a real solution to the market, it often is needed to mix different technologies for different objectives. So today, we've been through a very small part of our portfolio and a few small uh, key mechanisms. But we've reviewed how digestron, the phytogenics, the yeast, and the microfix can improve the host. We've looked at how organic acids and uh, phytogenics, that's top three in digesterone, can improve the pathogen inhibition. And by improving gut health, ultimately means less waste in the environment, so we can have improvements here as well. And this is how all of our products come together for a more holistic approach to disease management, taking into consideration these three key areas, host, pathogen, and environment. So with that, I thank you for listening. Um, and I look forward to any questions you may have. All right, Laurent, Ben, thank you both for that those remarks. Uh, we do indeed have some questions, so let, let's get to a few of those right now. Um, let's start with Ben. We had a, a question here specifically about how the um, bacterial challenge trial was performed. Uh, could you give us a, a bit more details on that? Um, sure. So. Um, I think the the one the trial I showed was with uh, with the phygogenic and with the streptococcus. That specific uh, challenge was done with immersion. So we have two main uh, three main strategies I guess we can use for for pathogen challenges. Um, the first one would be the easiest one, which is just an IP uh, injection, uh, injecting it into the abdomen of the fish. The second one would be an immersion. So the pathogen is in the water and it's a kind of a bath treatment. And the third option would be a cohabitation. So you put healthy fish in with unhealthy fish, um, and then you get the horizontal transfer this way. Personally, I prefer the last two, the, the immersion and the cohab, because this recreates the, uh, the natural kind of uh, pathology of, of, the, of the disease. One of the challenges that we have with the IP injection, especially if we're talking about gut health, you completely bypass the gut. So you're really giving this fish or even the shrimp a huge challenge. And this is a systemic problem, not a localized problem to the gut. So sometimes you miss out actually on key benefits of your feed or your feed solution by having this IP. On the other hand, we do have some trials with IP because it's depending on the feasibility. It's not always um, possible to make a, an immersion challenge. Sometimes we do see that, that feed additives as well can have a, uh, a benefit when there's an IP injection. And this means that actually the benefit of your solution has gone from the gut and it's actually affecting the whole organism and it's affecting the, um, the, the whole immunity of that organism. And we've also done some interesting work with head kidney gene expression, for example. So we can actually prove that although it's an additive which is acting in the gut, Actually, even at the head kidney, which is the, the major organ which is coordinating the immune response, is also seeing some of these benefits. And this also becomes very important when we talk about gill health, when we talk about skin health, for example. It's not just about protecting the gut, it's about building a more robust fish at the whole organism level. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you for that input. Uh, we have a, a couple of questions that we've received about extrusion, right, and, and pelleted feed. Uh, which is rather common in many places in the aqua sector. Uh, looking at the whole portfolio of different solutions we've talked about, acidifiers, phytogenics, microbials, uh, the mycotoxin deactivators, can these be applied to extruded feed? Are there any certain measures that need to be taken or considerations uh, taken into account, especially with higher temperatures? So maybe I can answer that first and then Loran can, can also complement my answer. Um, for sure, it's, it's definitely a consideration that, that we have to take into consideration. We can have the best active components in the world, but if you can't deliver them to the gut, then they are quite useless. So in Biomin, we utilize a number of different technologies. So we pick our carriers very, very carefully. We also uh, look at different encapsulations, for example, with the more volatile components. 
which has the uh, improves heat stability, but it also makes the additives easier to handle, for example, so it improves the granulometry, it improves the flowability, all of which are important, um, especially at the feed mill. You don't want to co co create lots of dust. Um, with some of the, the bacteria and with some of the enzymes, it's also possible to use a PPLA system um, if uh, that, that is an existent. And of course, we can also look at different doses, for example. So if we know we are losing 10% uh, or 20%, or we can also compensate this with an increased dosage. So for sure, it's a challenge, uh, but every challenge has a solution. And we are working hard um, every day to, to bring these, uh, bring these uh, results to the customers. Um, yeah, I agree with you, Ben. We, we have to have a, a good product, but we also have to be capable uh, to to be used and to be to be effective when they are into the the gastrointestinal tract after extrusion. And this is the why we have always to take care and to look for which components and which. Uh, uh, to be, to have a really careful look uh, for for the products that we are putting and which are the process that we are looking we are looking for. Um, uh, we also have this PPLA application that is quite too interesting for this kind of industry. I think it also has to be considered. But we we the best strategy is to look case by case, and we have all our, our, our technical people in the field that uh, they can support you in these technical issues for sure. Great, absolutely, and that uh, provides then a more tailored solution, which is going to bring us to our next question here. Um, it can ask about combinations of products, interestingly. So uh, is there anything to watch out for, any antagonistic effects if we're to use multiple additives in this case, or on the other side, would you see any benefits, any synergies to a combined solution? On, on the one hand, let's let's take the second part of the question first in terms of the benefits. For sure, there's the synergies and then there's complementaries. Um, so, as I said in my presentation, we have very complex issues in, in aquaculture and, and also in agriculture. And although every single additive company is searching for the silver bullet, you know, this billion dollar product, which is going to fix everybody's problems, um, unfortunately, as of today, it doesn't exist. So we have to utilize different technologies and different strategies ultimately to, 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 to build a solution. And this can include combining different products. It can also mean using different products at different phases of the cycle where we see more or less challenges relating to health, relating to nutrition, for example. In terms of the components that we have, um, there's not really too much negative interaction, I would say. Um, and just to add on to this, a lot of our products uh, are also going through the premixes as well. So it's also really important that we know that there's no interaction, not just between our additives, but there's also there's no interaction with vitamins, with minerals and with other components, which could be here as well. Occasionally, especially with the uh, when we go outside of Europe, when we're working with probiotics, for example, we have to be a slightly more careful here. Um, but also there's ways around this. So, for example, you can put uh, probiotics in the, uh, sorry, you can put um, the phytogenics or, or acidifies in the matrix, and then you put probiotics around the outside as a top coating. So there's also strategies that we can devise to overcome the potential conflicts that we see, um, but, but we generally don't see, see many, many challenges. Just to pick up on one more point in terms of combination of products, um, and bearing in mind this is a largely marine, uh, marine um, fish audience, we actually had some quite uh, good successes where we used a combination of uh, organic acids and, and phytogenics. That's a top three and digesterone. And this was particularly interesting for salmon. So in times of heat stress. So when the sea temperatures are increasing, the animals are perhaps becoming more stressed. They're more um, sensitive to these kind of opportunistic pathogens. I'm actually a combination of top three um, and, and digesterone was actually quite quite interesting here. That's great. Uh, I appreciate that. And in um, adding that to the, to the end of your response, you've actually answered another question uh, regarding heat stress. So um, we're going to go ahead. We have run a bit over the hour that we've allocated, uh, but we have uh, answered uh, the questions that have come in today. Uh, Laurent and Ben, it was a pleasure being with you. I want to thank you for your insights today.
I want to thank our audience as well for their attention for the great questions. If you have any more uh, questions, you know, feel free to reach out to your Biomin representative uh, regarding uh, product and solutions uh, that are best for you and your clientele. So on behalf of Biomin, I want to thank you for joining us today. Please do us a favor and when this session closes, go ahead and answer uh, the short questionnaire that will pop up on your screen. Let us know what you thought of today. Uh, your feedback is valuable to us. We use that in order to improve these sessions and to continue our discussions. On behalf of Biomed, I want to thank you all for joining. Have a great day. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.